In this lecture, we will be examining the reign of Justinian I, one of the greatest emperors of the Byzantine Empire. From our earlier lectures and readings, you should recall that the Roman Empire was divided into eastern and western halves. The western empire began to experience a series of Germanic invasions in the 4th and 5th centuries CE. As a result, imperial power shifted to the Eastern Roman Empire. After the fall of Rome, Constantinople was now the sole capital of what remained of the Roman Empire. Um, it stayed this way until the revival of the Western Empire in the 8th century and 9th century CE by Charlemagne. Justinian I is sometimes called the last Roman Emperor. Uh, he briefly reunited much of what had been the Roman Empire. Uh, he was born approximately 482 CE in a rural region of modern-day Macedonia. Justinian was adopted by his uncle Justin, who rose through the military ranks and was briefly proclaimed emperor from 518 to 527 CE, Justin. Uh, Justinian's family heritage was that of relatively poor peasant farmers. As his adoptive father Justin became increasingly senile, Justinian began acting as a de facto emperor. Upon becoming emperor, Justinian um, had sort of a, a one goal as an overview, and that being unity. Um, his desire, as you can see in the lower right-hand side, one God, one empire, one religion, um, developing orthodoxy along these lines. So he, in his efforts to achieve imperial unity, um, focused on streamlining the processes of government and making sure that all Christians followed the same faith and same faith traditions. Justinian was an ambitious builder. Perhaps his greatest building project was the magnificent domed church known as the Hagia Sophia, which you can see pictured on this slide. Uh, the name Hagia Sophia translates as Holy Wisdom, Church of the Holy Wisdom. Uh, the church was constructed in just five years. The architects of the design possessed training in physics, engineering, and mathematics. Such training was necessary in completing the cathedral's revolutionary new design, which joined an enormous uh, quadrangular basilica at the base with a circular dome on top that was built on pendentives and stone piers. A pendentive in mathematical terms is a triangular segment of a sphere. If you can picture um, slicing an orange and uh, trying to draw a triangle, and then you have that curved aspect to it. Um, these are used in construction. Pendentives, P-E-N-D-E-N-T-I-V-E-S. Um, they narrow to points at the base and widen at the top. Uh, the goal of creating a constant circular base for the dome at the wide parts of the triangles, the spherical triangles. The Corpus Juris Civilis, which translates as a body of civil law, is the name that modern historians use for a collection of fundamental works on law. These documents were created between 529 and 534 CE at the bidding of Justinian I. The Corpus Juris was influential throughout the Middle Ages on secular and church law and even today elements of the Corpus Juris can be found in legal traditions especially international law. Uh, there were four parts to it. The Codex, C-O-D-E-X, uh, was a compilation uh, both by selection and redaction or extraction of imperial enactments to date. So a, a collection of everything that emperors had written and decreed. The Pandecti, 
P-A-N-D-E-C-T-A-E. -E. This was um, something like an encyclopedia of extracts from the writings of Roman jurists. So these were not laws, but opinions on laws. The section known as Institu Instituciones, it was a student law textbook. And the Novelle Constituciones, literally new laws. Um, these were laws that uh, uh, were promulgated by Justinian and codified. We'll talk uh, specifically about some of the um, aspects of this throughout the rest of the lecture, but heresy was uh, an important concern in the Corpus Juris Civilis, as were laws that by today's standards would be considered anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish. And in general, um, this was uh, an attempt to define, to broaden, and to um, expand imperial power in the Byzantine Empire. Theodora was the wife of Justinian I, and she ruled as an empress. She was an extremely powerful woman for the time period, and some historical sources referred to Theodora as a co-ruler. Theodora equaled, certainly, and occasionally exceeded Justinian in terms of political acumen and uh, overall astuteness, which is not to say that Justinian was uh, you know, not the sharpest tool in the drawer, but um, rather that Theodora was an exceptionally bright woman. She was likely of uh, Greek Cypriot ethnicity, and she was probably born either on modern-day island of Cyprus or a nearby region in present-day Syria or Lebanon around the year 500 CE. So she's about 20 years uh, younger than Justinian. Theodora was of rather humble origins. Her father was a, uh, by tradition, was a bear trainer, while her mother was a stage entertainer, singer, dancer, actress. Uh, Theodora may have worked in a brothel in her teens, and later she was a stage performer whose theatrical shows let's just say may have included, included some risque scenes and nudity. However, we should note that the historical sources that discuss Theodora's past might have wished to paint her in a negative light. So we have to take these uh, suggestions of, uh, of her early years with a grain of salt. Um, it is possible that, uh, that uh, these actions or behaviors um, didn't happen quite the same way as they were portrayed. Certainly, though, we can say with some confidence that Theodora was a woman who made the most of her talents to climb to unprecedented, unprecedented social heights for a commoner in that time period. Christianity's role as a state religion was enhanced during the reign of Justinian I. Under Justinian, heresy became a crime again especially in terms of uh, prosecution, and two heresies in particular carried the death penalty. The first of these was not accepting the Nicene Creed, and the second of these was rebaptism. baptism um, Some churches and faith traditions within Christianity um, will practice rebaptism. They will claim that uh, the, the original baptism a person received in a different church was not valid or was not legitimate uh, due to doctrinal differences between the two churches. So Justinian uh, outlawed that. Um, he also promoted anti-Jewish laws, such as not allowing Jews to testify in court and ordering that some synagogues be converted into churches. Um, due to this emphasis on religion, which is a very pervasive um, power of the state, the absolute powers of the emperor became a tradition under Justinian, and this tradition of powerful emperors uh, remained influential throughout the Middle Ages. The uh, 6th century CE um, under Justinian saw all other religions considered, and this is a quote, demented and insane. Justinian developed a reputation, you can see this word at the second bullet point, aquemetos, as the sleepless one, that's how that translates, due to his uh, unceasing efforts at uh, promoting Christianity, the version of Christianity that uh, he supported. He campaigned against Nestorianism and Arianism. 
these were two um, sort of competing versions of Christianity. Arianism, for example, uh, argued that Christ was created by God. Arianism denied that uh, God the Father and God the Son were equal and co-eternal. And the Nestorians had a um, uh, kind of a monophysite um, approach to understanding the nature of Christ. Um, yet, despite this, um, and, and despite this emphasis on rooting out heresy, uh, Justinian was rather lackluster in his efforts against monophytism. This is, again, the, the idea in the case of Jesus Christ, where divine and human natures are unified in one form, and the two natures are united without separation. Um, and this is probably because uh, Theodora followed a, his wife followed a uh, monophysite faith tradition. So uh, you know how this works. Happy wife equals uh, happy life, they always say. During Justinian's reign, the empire's strength was to be found in its cities. There were more than 1,500 cities in the empire, far surpassing any of the other empires of the same time period in the world. Um, in the city of Constantinople, there were over 350,000 inhabitants at its peak during his reign. The city of Constantinople became a sort of crossroads for Asian and European civilizations. In the 552 CE, Orthodox monks brought back silkworm eggs from China, and silk production eventually became a Byzantine royal monopoly. This is also related to a decline in the uh, use of what we earlier described as the Silk Road. Between the 4th and 5th centuries CE, um, government councils were typically made up of local wealthy landowners. By definition, of course, these individuals were not necessarily loyal to the emperor due to the fact that they paid land taxes. Uh, by the 6th century CE, special governors and bishops replaced councils. These individuals proved to be much more loyal to the emperor since they did not have that conflict of interest related to land taxes. This was a trend that was uh, expanded on during the reign of Justinian. Um, during the reign of Justinian, a uh, particularly harsh, severe plague hit the empire. Uh, there were mortality rates of up to 40% in, in some cities. The plague recurred numerous times between 541 and 700 CE. Um, while historians disagree on the exact percentages and numbers, because again, we, we have to use models to sort of uh, project the death toll, Europeans population, European population rather, decreased between 40 and 55 percent by 700 CE. Uh, most historians, though not all I should add, believe this was an epidemic of bubonic plague. Yersinia pestis, uh, Y-E-R-S-I-N-A-P-E-S-T-I-S. -E -S -S. This is the same um, organism that was responsible for the Black Death or the bubonic plague in the 14th century, which we'll get to in a couple lectures. The best source we have for information about the plague was a Procopius. He was a scholar in Palestine. He had accompanied... Um, Byzantine general Belisarius on numerous expeditions. At times he is questionable in his veracity, especially when it comes to political issues. But uh, as you can see here, um, he describes a bubonic swelling that developed. And this took place not only in the particular part of the body, which is called the bubon, that is below the abdomen or the groin, but also inside the armpit, in some cases beside the ears and at different points on the thighs. So what he's describing here is uh, is an organism that is manifesting itself in the lymph nodes, which is a classic uh, symptom of bubonic plague. Um, we have yet to unearth plague victims from the time period and test them. Um,
for DNA evidence of Yersinia pestis, but chances are this is the, the particular plague or some, some variant of that. Interestingly too, Justinian um, contracted the disease, hung on for several weeks, nearly died at the time. And unfortunately for Justinian, after he recovered, it appears that he had suffered some um, some cognitive um, disability or some damage to his brain. Um, he was not quite the same afterwards, was a bit more prone to paranoia, um, seemed to have really lost something in the illness, but uh, he did survive. Finally, this map shows the furthest extent of the Byzantine Empire. The empire was at its peak in 565 as Justinian's reign came to a close. The empire encompassed most of the regions surrounding the Mediterranean, and you can see for a brief period, much of what had been the Roman Empire was unified um, under Justinian. This draws to a close our brief examination of the life and reign of Justinian I.